It is a privilege uh, to be with you all today to talk about growing the field of plant humanities. Um, what could be more exciting than this emerging space where the sciences, arts and humanities meet to help address some of the most urgent questions of our day. Usually relegated to the background as greenery, plants are stepping into the limelight of critical inquiry. The urgency of accelerating extinctions alongside the slow violence of climate change and the spread of invasive species make plants crucial indicators of change, collapse and resilience. Plants are also protagonists in the ongoing historical reassessment of the legacies of European imperial expansion, extractive capitalism and their environmental and human impact. Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse is a recent example of how plants viewed as cultural agents guide us through this complex narrative of modernity, tying the legacies of settler colonialism to climate change. Plants offer unique windows into another urgent topic of our day, migration. Beginning in the early modern period, the global influx of specimens, the network of botanical gardens as laboratories for transplantation, the vast archives they engendered and the plantation system that grew out of these developments triggered vast voluntary and forced migrations. The dislocations that followed transformed ecosystems, destroyed habitats, and precipitated the rapid human alterations to the planet's life systems that we experience as climate change. There could hardly be a more urgent time for us to focus on plant humanities. In the next 20 minutes, I will share with you a brief account of plant humanities at Dumbarton and Oaks. You see here the museum and main house, a Harvard Research Institute located in Washington, DC. I will describe our goal technologies and research, but I will begin by summing up three lessons I learned from leading this project. First, the importance of collaboration and co-production of knowledge by participants from different disciplines and at different career stages. Second, the storytelling opportunities afforded by special collections and digital repositories. And last but not least, the extraordinary insights into what humans value and how we ended up in our current predicament afforded us when we put plants at the center of our inquiry. Dumbarton Oaks is a fertile ground for cultivating the plant humanities. We have long supported garden and landscape studies. We are rooted in a historic garden that celebrates its centennial this summer. And we are home to a rare collection of botanical images and publications. Historically, our focus has been on designed landscapes and gardens rather than plants as cultural actants. The Plant Humanities Initiative launched in 2018 is a relatively new endeavor. Its roots lie in a 2013 symposium, the Botany of Empire in the long 18th century that are organized to highlight the rare book collection and bring plants to center stage. The conference resulted in a 2016 publication that attracted interest from JSTOR, a digital library that includes among its holdings, 3 million high resolution images of herbarium specimens in the global plants database. In 2018, we submitted sister grants with JSTOR Labs, the development art of JSTOR to the Mellon Foundation. A few months later, we began work on a digital site and scholarly programming to support the emerging field of plant humanities, which studies and communicates the extraordinary influence of plants on human cultures. Our initiative may be one of the first recorded instances of the term plant humanities, but the area we represent is not new. Rather, the term is a capacious umbrella that embraces aspects of the environmental humanities, as well as botany, history, art history, the history of science, literature, and race, gender, and indigenous studies, among others. Interrogating our assumptions in constant dialogue with scientists is an important aspect of our endeavor. One of the hallmarks of our enterprise has been the collaborative production and dissemination of knowledge. Our team includes researchers, librarians, designers, and developers. It also includes participants from the undergraduate to the postdoctoral level and senior scholars. For the future of plant humanities, 
This meeting ground of different career stages, collections, and fields of expertise will be essential. These are some of our fellows. From top left and going clockwise, a historian of the early modern period, a food historian, an ethnobotanist, a historian of 18th century natural history collections, a historian of pharmacy, and an art historian of the 19th century, just to give you a sense of what it takes to come up with a project like this in terms of disciplinary interests. The ongoing pandemic has driven home the necessity and opportunity of digital engagement. From its inception, our project has had an important digital dimension seeking to leverage and provide pathways to the wealth of digitized plant specimens and resources available in vast repositories such as global plants and the biodiversity heritage library. So I'm, seeing, I'm showing you here the homepage of the Plant Humanities Lab, the digital uh, site we've been developing over the past three years. The lab launched a year ago in beta form and currently presents 17 interactive narratives with another dozen in production, featuring text on the left and visualizations on the right, on plants such as cacao, cassava, sunflower, Carolina rice, cinnamon, banana, and others with fascinating cultural histories. One key idea that has informed our work is the mobility of plants. Consider the lab narrative of cassava, which I'm not showing you here, poisonous when eaten raw, Cassava was rendered harmless by indigenous peoples of Meso and South America who developed tools and methods for processing it into food. That knowledge traveled along with the plants to other areas of the world so that today it is a diet staple of more than 600 million people, including millions on the African continent and crucial to global food security. Plant mobility is intimately tied to the voluntary enforced migrations of humans. Digital media help visualize this entwined mobility of plants and people, and the mapping feature I'm showing you here is a key feature of the lab. Another aspect we seek to communicate are the multiple characters of plants as agents and participants in human history. Their role changes depending on the organisms they interact with and their cultural and environmental context. The network visualization we developed, you can see it here in action, conveys the many facets of plants and their embeddedness in complex relationships with other plants, animals, and humans. Our third goal, is to help redress our obliviousness to plants. There are cognitive reasons why plants make a limited call on our attention that have to do with their perceived lack of movement, their different temporality, even the inferior status they have been ascribed in many philosophical traditions. At the same time, we know that many indigenous classification systems record hundreds or even thousands of species and their properties so obliviousness to plants is a cultural predicament. The lab encourages close looking at plants through IIIF images, such as the one I'm showing you, at high resolution that are contextualized and interpreted through narrative, image comparison, annotation, and other features. We cannot value and protect what we cannot see. The plant humanities have to contend with a fundamental paradox. Today, two fifths of plants are threatened with extinction largely as the result of human activity, yet plants are the foundation of all the planetary life systems on which our survival depends, and for example, the source of medicines for more than 70% of global human populations. Taking a close look at plants and their evolutionary and cultural histories is important to our recognition of them, our rediscovery of their unique value and importance. Although the narratives I've shown you are the centerpiece of the lab, it goes without saying that even 17 or even 100 won't even begin to make a dent. It was therefore important to provide pathways so visitors can begin their own investigations. And this is the search interface of the lab. The lab features a search, a search and resource discovery interface powered by linked open data. Oops, excuse me, show you this. 
A student can enter any plant into the search box and find articles, images, and herbarium specimens. The search leverages Wikidata alongside related primary and secondary sources from vast repositories such as JSTOR Global Plants, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, JSTOR, and ArtStore. All features are open access, including the visual essay tool that was used to create the narratives I showed you, which is called Juncture and was developed by JSTOR Labs for our project. We are very interested in developing the lab as a tool of inclusive pedagogy for faculty and students in plants and people courses, and we welcome ideas for collaboration. Pedagogical innovation also drives how we create content for the lab. Many of the plant narratives are researched and written by fellows and students of our Plant Humanities Summer Program, which launched in 2019. The program combines seminars and guest lectures with digital training in the tools used in the lab, and the students and working teams to research, create, and code their own narratives, which are edited, peer-reviewed, and published with full credit on the site. Students learn how to collaborate and integrate different approaches, acquire digital skills, and practice how to synthesize information and communicate it to an audience outside their disciplinary comfort zone. Today's early career humanists are passionately interested in migration, climate change, legacies of colonialism and capitalism and social justice. The cultural histories of plants offer fascinating entry points for all these questions. Beyond the, inter the internet and the classroom, plants offer remarkable opportunity for public engagement through public gardens and museum collections. This is an exhibition that just closed at Dunbar Noakes and which I curated with my co-investigator in the Plant Humanities Project, Dr. Anatol Chikin, who curates our rare book collection. The exhibition featured 20 beautiful watercolors of Amazonian flora by Margaret Mee, the British artist, explorer, and early environmental activist. Titled Portraits of Plants, the exhibition situated Margaret Mee within a tradition of women botanical artists going back to the 17th century from our rare book collection, and which continues today in the practice of artists such as Nirupa Rao, a National Geographic Storytelling Fellow, who works with conservationists and scientists to document, communicate, and preserve the botanical images as a dialogue between art and science, inspired by the work of Amy Myers and Theresa Malley. Yet we almost succumbed to a blind spot that is perhaps inherent in the visual tradition, whether botanical art, scientific illustration, or the herbarium. The rendering of the singular specimen removed from its natural context, abstracted, as Amy said, and portrayed against the neutral background. We know that plants do not isolation, yet it took a, a conversation with a scientist, Smithsonian botanist John Crest, for us to realize that the way we were displaying the works and the choices we were making continued to detach plants from their environments. At the 11th hour and at the distress of our exhibition manager, we the loan of two etchings by the artist Brian Poole that depict Heliconia's tropical beauties and one of Margaret Mee's favorite subjects with the pollinators on whom they depend. The evolutionary tale told by these images is fascinating. The male and female of a single species of hummingbird on the Caribbean island of Dominica have evolved to visit different species of Heliconia suited to their differently shaped bills. You lose one species to climate change or habitat loss, and you lose all three. Such complex and delicate relationships evolved in deep time within ecosystems that are increasingly under threat and were crucial to the story we wanted to tell. They also reflect the growing environmental advocacy of the artist we highlighted, Margaret Mee herself, who later in her career, after three decades in the Amazon, became increasingly uh, concerned about the degradation of its ecosystems and starting painting back in the background of her botanical works, transforming them from portraits to landscapes and re-embedding them in their network of relationships, such as this painting of a philodendron that concluded the exhibit where the plant existed first and then the artist went back 
and added the background later. The lessons of the exhibition lead me to respectfully disagree with the poet John Keats's complaint that science unweaves the rainbow. Science can ignite our wonder and appreciation, and when combined with humanistic interpretation and engaging storytelling, it sharpens our empathy for the beauty and fragility of these unique evolutionary relationships of which we partake. This work of synthesis as an overcoming of disciplinary boundaries and a call to action is the very ground and raison d'etre of the plant humanities. Because the plant humanities engage so many different audiences, evaluating our project is a complex undertaking. We have developed a stakeholder engagement plan to get feedback from different communities. And an incredibly energizing group have been our virtual faculty residencies piloted last June and to be repeated this year. Please apply. Over two weeks, we offer training in the lab and solicit input. Last year's group included a botanist, a photographer, researchers of African diaspora and Latin American foodways, a sociologist and an art historian. We were joined by Romita Ray, who initiated us in the ways that plants catalyze our embodied experience and organize multi-species relationships. And Shumana Roy, who revealed to us the rich tradition and potential of Indian plant humanities while awakening our ethical and aesthetic sensibilities. The work of scholars like Shumana and Romita inspires me to think that the intellectual and material landscape of India, with its biodiversity and rich spiritual, medicinal, botanical, horticultural, and literary dimensions, not to mention its digital talent, is an incredibly promising ground for the plant humanities to flourish. I will end with an example from my own research that brings me back to the theme of the conference climate change and healing through the perspective of the plant humanities. In those days of virtual encounters, our physical location remains telling. I join you today, not from my home in DC, but from Miami, Florida, a region of great biodiversity and great vulnerability to climate change. No more than six miles from here is an artwork that I saw at the beginning of this project and has haunted my thinking about plants, people, and our environmental predicament ever since. The work is Anselm Kiefer's Secret of the Ferns in the Margulis collection. A German artist born in 1945, Kiefer has wrestled throughout his career with the legacy of the Holocaust through vast landscapes of ruins and scorched earth. But Secret of the Ferns takes the artist's apocalyptic sensibility in a different direction the slow violence of climate change and accelerated extinctions. What fascinated me from the beginning was Kiefer's use of the herbarium. I suspect it's partly because the herbarium is a way of preserving and archiving beings that were once alive. Framed dried ferns hang in rows across a massive hole with two abandoned concrete bunkers spewing coal in the center. The secret of the ferns in the exhibition's title and installation's title is given away by the coal, an allusion to ferns as the source of fossil fuels and accounts for the installation's overall mood of catastrophe. An inscription in charcoal above one of the bunker entrances reads carbon, which in German refers to the carboniferous, when innumerable members of the fern family sunk into anoxic swamps to become fossil fuels. Above carbon, also in charcoal is in German the, the phrase coal for another two millennia, which strikes a note of naive arrogance. For not only is there not enough coal to burn for another two millennia, but a fraction of that time span, science tells us, would suffice to reduce most species to extinction and threaten human existence on the planet. Whoever the inhabitants of these desolate bunkers may have been, they run out of time. If the herbarium started as an aid to memory, here it has become a vehicle of memorialization, perhaps of mourning. The mood in the installation is definitely elegiac, evoking a temporality at the end of time. If the installation presents fern specimens as the sole survivors of a future apocalypse, ferns are also for Kiefer, quote, the first plants. Among the oldest groups in existence, Ferns are living fossils that embody deep geological time. 
Moreover, they carry rich symbolical associations. One of the ways in which the artist restores vitality and meaning to the dried specimens and lumps of coal, plants as specimen, fuel, or commodity, is through charcoal inscriptions on the frames. These writings offer another clue to the secret of the ferns by hinting at their rich cultural associations. There are many stories and folk tales about plants having memories, Kiefer suggests in the installation's wall text. The inscriptions reactivate those cultural memories and remind us that human communities have woven their rituals and marked important transitions in close entanglement with plants. The most numerous inscriptions refer to St. John's Night or Midsummer Eve. Across Europe, Midsummer Night fused pagan and Christian rituals that included bonfires, water, and the collection of plants with protective and healing properties. Other inscriptions, such as the one on the right, allude to a recurrent theme in Kiefer's art, alchemy as a stand-in for the process of transformation. Plants are alchemists in transforming sunlight into energy that all other living beings on earth can use. Scientific collections such as herbaria are also capable of transformation. Created for one purpose, plant identification, they now serve new purposes such as modeling the effects of climate change. Artists are alchemists in transforming humble materials into transformative experiences. In the case of Secret of the Ferns, dead plants and coal to awaken our ethical and aesthetic response to the slow violence of climate change. For the effect of the installation is to loosen our customary cognitive moorings to the world, activating the emotions and imagination. It accomplishes this partly through the play of scale, with the oversight specimens and the enclosed bunkers, transporting us through space and time as only the embodied experience of storytelling can do. It activates the dead plants through language, folklore, and their associations, and it transforms the herbarium into a vehicle for commemoration and mourning. Climate change is precipitating mourning of untold losses, of organisms, but also ways of life, and yet undiscovered or forgotten plant secrets that might heal our future. But for the visitor of Secret of the Ferns, mourning can also be an alchemical experience mediated by art and the cultural associations of plants. In the words of theorist Judith Butler, quote, perhaps mourning has to do with agreeing to undergo a transformation, the full result of which one cannot know in advance, end of quote. I have come to think that Secret of the Ferns exerts such a powerful hold on me because it suggests the still uncharted potential of the plant humanities to help transform our understanding of our current human and environmental predicament and our future paths. Thank you.